I'm Julian Assange. Roger, I'll get you into strength. Editor of WikiLeaks, we've exposed the world's secrets. These documents belong to the United States government. Being attacked by the powerful. The United States strongly condemned. Hey, quit asking questions. He broke the law. Illegally shoot the son of a b For 500 days now, I've been detained without charge. But that hasn't stopped us. My check. Today, we're on a quest for revolutionary ideas that can change the world tomorrow. This week, I speak to the leader of the Malaysian opposition, Anwar Ibrahim. As a rising internal rival to the former Prime Minister Mahathir, Anwar was in prison for five years after being smeared with sex allegations. As a result of a popular campaign in 2004, his conviction was overturned and he was released from prison. In 2008, he was again targeted with sex crimes allegations. He won the case early this year. With Malaysian elections looming and Anwar tipped to win, he has now been charged with unauthorised assembly. If found convicted, he will be prevented from running. I want to know, how has he survived and what does he see as the future of Asia and the West? Anwar Ibrahim, you were a student activist um, from your early days within Malaysia and you were imprisoned um, as a young man. Can you, can you tell me a little bit about what your big political progression is over this time. I mean, I was arrested for supporting uh, land, uh, f farmers in the north, um, demanding uh, some uh, treatment, fairer treatment from the government. And it was two years uh, in detention without trial. There was Internal Security Act. But uh, later, when Mahathir became prime minister, he came uh, with a mission, clearly as a reformer, and I was frankly attracted to that. We had a series of discussions, and I joined on this uh, reform platform and uh, came up very fast to become deputy prime minister, only to be sent back for um, six years' imprisonment. Uh, under Mahathir, um, there are a number of people who came up to the position of being deputy prime minister and were cast out uh, one by one. And but your fall from grace uh, was the most dramatic. Can you tell me what happened? Um, I was, of course, badly assaulted. The first day I was uh, uh, sent to the police uh, custody. I was sent then uh, to solitary confinement in prison. It was, of course, not a bed of roses. It was tough. Uh, initially, I was not given even books to read. But uh, the international media and friends internationally did voice out. And I think finally they did concede and allowed books. And I thought I become slightly smarter, being able to read um, the complete works of Shakespeare four and a half times. That's rare. <laughs> All the classics, Boris Pasternak and, you know, Tolstoy, you reread them in prison. And it's interesting, from the prism of prison walls, you understand, you appreciate better. There's no interruption. You uh, immerse yourself in the storyline. Sometimes a bit depressing, of course, uh, you know, having to look at the walls. But you keep, you, you know, you, you, you become part, you know, a player. You, 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 I mean, I've never um, internalized or appreciated a bit King Lear, one, you know, uh, the dialogue uh, with uh, Cordelia, you know, until you um, end it in solitary confinement. When I, when I was in, in prison and I read Cancer Ward, this book by Solzhenitsyn, which is a very a, a wonderful, wonderful book, but very, very depressing um, and very brutal. Uh, but I felt, well, there's, there's worse places I could be. I could be in a Siberian cancer ward with cancer, for instance. <laughs> And, and what did you feel as, this is of interest to me because I have a, a number of friends who have been imprisoned. Your view about how to handle the experience, did you have a method? Uh, how did you control the perception of the passage of time and things like this? Well, it was tough. I mean, now we think it may, it may sound easy, but at that particular time it was very tough because I was, uh, you know, 
my kids were very small then. The youngest was still in, in kindergarten. And the day at that time I was arrested, I could see, I mean, could just picture their, their anguish and, you know, and despair. But what gave you some strength, the prison officers and guards were extremely friendly. They were very scared. There were cameras all around. But you can sense their sympathy and support. That keeps you going because then there's some whisperings about what was happening, demonstrations outside. Um, but otherwise, uh, I just kept uh, myself just very busy. Oh, not all serious, Julian. I've got to be very honest. Uh, I spent long, not long hours, but a certain uh, in, in, the, in the washroom, in the bathroom, singing uh, the Beatles or Ricky Nelson or Alice Presley. <laughs> <laughs> And, and why are you inside? Outside, your wife is pushing forward a, a big campaign uh, for, for your release. Did, did you have any idea yes. how, how big this um, movement was that she had created while you're inside? Not really, but uh, from the whisperings of, uh, and, and uh, missives uh, from the guards who sometimes let us smuggle in, then they realised, for example, some of the uh, prison officers would tell me, I attended the rally about 10 miles of Kuala Lumpur. And then uh, we heard, you know, your wife and the speeches. And I said, Who, how many attended? I said, at least 20,000 people. So I thought there's something, something, you know, real happening in uh, Kuala Lumpur. And I could, of course, sense that because the day I was arrested, we have a for the first time, the biggest ever rally in the history of Malaysia. 100,000 people in Dataran Mardek, I felt en greatly encouraged in terms of news from the prison guards. They would tell me, yeah, we were there, and uh, many of them on the quiet became members of the party. And, and di did you have a sense um, of being part of, of Malaysian history, of being part of something bigger than yourself, when you heard about these protests outside and the, the movement um, surrounding trying to get you out. You trust in the wisdom of the masses. How, how is it that you can gather 100,000 people without that sophistication, without media access, but could still reflect based on the dictates of their conscience or the habits of the heart? How did you get out in the end? When you, why were you released from prison? What was the finding? In this case, what happened was they persuaded the federal court to suggest that, well, we do believe Anwar may be a bit guilty, but there was no clear evidence, and therefore um, his appeal is uh, accepted. So, so you come back into Malaysia, and um, in the lead up to 2008, an extraordinary year uh, in Malaysian politics, um, you try and get into, um, you try and get elected uh, to parliament. What, what happens during that year? Um, yeah, we, went, we worked very hard. You know, uh, we don't have any access to the media. The entire media was good to support the ruling party. Uh, even today, as leader of the opposition, I don't have even one minute of air time. That's why I decided to and accepted your invitation. <laughs> Can you imagine, with not a minute of air time, we could still win five states, including Kuala Lumpur, we won 10 out of 11 parliamentary seats. So I believe we are you know, ripe for a, some sort of a Malaysia spring through the uh, electoral process. Um, but we worked very hard, as you said, in 2007, 2008, and we did work uh, harder among the ethnic minorities because we found that from 1999 to 2004, they were a bit apprehensive because the policies, they thought it's just a better uh, 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 struggle among the Malay leaders, um, supporting the same policies. And I said, to the contrary, we are a reform party, committed to a reform agenda. Some of the obsolete policies, race-based, uh, has to change with the times. I, I want to, to look at um, this change in the Southeast Asian region. So there was a democracy movement in Indonesia, which was successful, uh, uh, a breakaway of East Timor from Indonesia. 
what do you think was driving this? Was it the internet? Was it greater um, movement of people amongst the region? What, why at this, this time you had a, the Asian economic crisis? Was that one of the drivers? You can sense the change taking place in the region because there's an improved or enhanced level of education. Uh, people are getting more sophisticated. And among the urban and the suburban areas, there is also new access to the alternative media. The internet played a very significant role. People want freedom. And you find this uh, notion uh, in the last elections, there's a growing trend, particularly among the young and professionals and intellectuals. So Malaysia is part and parcel of this uh, change. And now with the Arab Spring, is more, um, I think, um, imminent that we can sense this change coming. Uh, but you look at Thailand, people consider the uh, democratic transition somewhat more fragile. But in terms of the commitment towards a democratic transition was there. So any sort of a coup or military dictatorship cannot be, uh, be expected to sustain for far too long. Philippines is more uh, reassuring, although they're still having to grapple with the problem of endemic corruption. But Burma, which is quite shocking in terms of change. I mean, I am one of the voices, lone voices in uh, even the Malaysian government those days that have never uh, had uh, any hope of a military junta reforming itself. Uh, but I have to acknowledge there is some more positive uh, changes taking place in terms of democratic transition, access to media, uh, or freer elections, Burma is way ahead of Malaysia today. Burma, in really? Amazing. Yes, yes, because, because you have Aung San Suu Kyi on television. Um, right, and, uh, we and you're not Malaysia. committed in practice. Yeah. But, but it certainly is not democratic. Yeah. I mean, it would be uh, fallacious to assume um, that Burma is a democratic country. Mm. Mm. But, but you, you find there's some sort of a more positive, more reassuring change towards democratic reform. What, what, do, you see, what do you see is the security situation? Um, Julia Gillard, the Australian Prime Minister, has now agreed to station some 3,000 US Marines in the north of Australia um, as a, clearly as a sort of long-term pushback against any possible uh, Chinese influence. Did, what's going to happen to these countries in the middle? Um, do you think that the ASEAN countries should form a united security pact? I'm not a great uh, supporter of this security pacts, uh, but there should be a strong regional understanding uh, between these countries, political, economic, uh, cultural, and, and that would be enough uh, to show that you can deter any form of possible interference by outside uh, forces, be it uh, the West or China. Uh, because security pact, Julian, for our countries would require enormous sums of money. It will always be at the expense of education, public health, housing, and poverty alleviation. And I have that huge problem in my mind. If we don't have some kind of security pact or, or alliance of the Southeast Asian states, won't it be the case that China picks off an alliance here. Another country um, goes into bed with the United States. Uh, and in that way, um, uh, there's not a, a, a coherent sphere in Southeast Asia, but rather there's sort of a chessboard with black squares and white squares and everyone on one side or the other. Well, we can avoid that, not necessarily by having a security pact, but a strong regional uh, body, they have clear understanding. And the parameter would include not to allow any of our countries to be a base for the superpowers. This was the arrangement before. I mean, the Philippines has a problem because they already had... They already had the US for a long time. Yeah, yeah. but the understanding was not to increase. Yeah, let, let's, let's talk a, a little bit about uh, Prime Minister Najab and the ruling clique. Uh, when I was in Malaysia in, in 2009 and was very briefly detained by um, special branch, the, the <laughs> secret police there, after, after attending uh, an election, um, the, the people I was speaking to um, were saying, whatever you do, 
uh, don't mention this Alantawa murder. This is the murder of the Mongolian beauty who was, uh, body was blown up um, with C4 explosives and who was alleged to have been uh, Najib's, um, the prime, now current prime minister's lover. And my response to this was, well, why not? Well, because as soon as you do, if we ever do this at a rally, uh, the, the police turn up and they start arresting everyone, uh, which I thought was a great opportunity because whenever you want to have a lot of police somewhere, you have a button <laughs> that you can press at your time and place of choosing uh, to get them there. But can, can you describe this uh, murder case and why is it still so sensitive in Malaysia? It should not be sensitive. I br brought this up in, uh, in Parliament. And, uh, of course, uh, the, the Speaker or the um, members of the ruling party seemed very upset. I did not in any way infer that uh, Najib uh, was even complicit to the murder. What we said was there were major questions unresolved. Number one, why did you change the judge? Number two, why was there no proper investigation? Number three, why were the key people not called as witnesses in the case? I mean, it's a major issue. And this case, the murder of Altan Tuya, is related to a major uh, corruption scandal involving the purchase or procurement of two submarines from France. Now, the case now is in the uh, Paris courts. How is it can be heard and opened up in the Paris court and we are completely silent about that. In Malaysia, in Malaysia, the testimony of a number of the witnesses in this case was secret for some reason. Yes, secret and, and, and worse. In 2008, around the time of the election in Malaysia, you suffered a second accusation of sodomy um, bought by one of your aides. It was just a smear campaign went on about the sodomy charge and every village they displayed this video um, about the uh, so-called statement from the complainant. But again, as I said, William, you know, don't underestimate the wisdom of the people. You have the entire cabinet, the entire government resources, every night in the national media abusing me and still I increase my majority. But worse is to use this as a political ploy, trump up charges use the police, and finally even the judiciary. Although finally, Julian, I was acquitted, but never suggest that the judiciary was independent. Right through, they could just entertain and allow the prosecution just to abuse. The most disgusting is when you use this facade, democracy, democratic elections, judicial independence, and, and you abuse the process. I'm sorry, I sound a bit strong in this case. No, no, I, I, um, I, I sometimes feel like speaking this way myself, so I'm, I'm glad you did. <laughs> so, and, Anwar, let, let's talk about um, the, the future. We have a, a good por portrait of, of Malaysia now. But so let's talk about where Malaysia's going forward and where the region is going forward. Um, what is your plan for Malaysia if your opposition coalition was to win government? Immediately, we should mature as a democracy. Okay? Uh, we have uh, a largely much better infrastructure and more educated workforce. Uh, don't treat Malaysia in a, such a condescending manner that people are not prepared to uh, already to be uh, exercise their freedom, which means you know, independent judiciary, free media, um, and, and uh, an economic policy that can promote growth, market economy, at the same time, understand the abuses. When, when we uh, talk about in our discourse, even the Arab Spring, Arab Spring, one area, clamoring for freedom reform. Then we have Occupy Wall Street. Yeah. The limitations, the unbridled, uh, you know, um, greed. And, and uh, the gap between the very rich and very poor, complicity of, between the big business groups and uh, politics. This we need to avoid because you should learn but from the frustrations. And, from uh, the frustrations in the West. Yeah. In the West. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, your uh, experience too, and the fact that they're now exposed to WikiLeaks. Yeah. You can sense the uh, 
hypocrisy, the, the uh, paradox uh, and, and, and contradictions between these you know, pronouncements and what was actually the missive sent. That you made a major contribution. Not everybody agree this the missive. Some of the missives are even at my expense. But, but I support that. You know why? Because you understand what is real politic, what is the so-called the hypocrisy of the notion of diplomacy that is not based on truth or morality or ethical standards, but pure brute power and parochial or national interest. So I think this needs to change. Why can't Malaysia, after half a century, bring this new sense among Malays, uh, Chinese, Indians, or Dayas that, look, we are a big family, we can move up together? Why can't it be done? Why is, so, why is it so difficult? It's a rich country, you know. We have 90 billion ringgit net income from petroleum. We're not like most of our neighbors having to import and having this, you know, drag. What, what, will, it, what will it take for that to be done? Is, is, it, is, it, is it a matter of, of education? No, it is leadership, Julian. It's a courage, a conviction, tenacity of purpose. You want to do something good, you must not be corrupt. And, I mean, and, and, and it has to work. And, and of course, politics is the art of compromise. I'm not saying that you know, you're like a political philosopher dictating issues, and, but there are certain ground rules that you have to accept and adopt. You know? I mean, you attack. The moment you say you are for democracy, you become a Western stooge. But the moment you talk about market economy, you become a you know, Soros agent. But you know, these things. I've these, been one of those. Uh, <laughs> you have it now. The moment I have an interview with you, you know what's going to happen after this. <laughs> but I think you know, people. You know, uh, the problem with these authoritarian leaders, and at times, even the leaders in the West, that include you know, this strong Islamophobia, this uh, uh, we against them, this uh, you know unilateral policy of the United States. I mean, they, I, I, I don't, I don't sense that they even. Uh, ascribe to the ideals, the initial spirit of the American Revolution, or Jeffersonian ideals, you know, or the habits of the heart that Tocqueville talked about. They don't. And that is our, our, our concern. But, but we have to do it in a small way, in a small country, not too ambitious to be a great nation on earth, but at least for Malaysia, what is it? Why is it so difficult to make a village uh, guy, a Malay farmer, and a Chinese uh, petty trader or Indian estate worker feel that they're being respected and recognized as a citizen, given the dignity as a citizen. I don't think it takes a lot. It takes just conscience, sincerity, and courage of conviction. Very good. Anwar Ibrahim, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> and good luck. So, so that's, that's, that's very, very nice. Thank you, Anwar. Um, we've got lots of good material there. Um, so so ac actually, just as a matter of curiosity, I interviewed the president of uh, Tunisia. D did you manage to, to meet with him when you were over there, the new president? No, I was, un un unfortunately, that time they were convening, hosting the Syrian uh, opposition. Oh, yeah, the, fr so the, I yeah, the uh, yeah, Friends Tunisia. of Syria. So Tunisia. I just met Rashid Ghanoussi and half the cabinet and 60 MPs there for this dialogue, mainly on this issue about you know, democratic reform okay. and, and uh, you know, that they, they have a major role because if they go to, to, to be too, too tough on some of the Islamic issues, then, you know, there'd be yeah. a greater concern about the role of Islam. Mama, back to you. So you yeah. What's happening in the yeah. status? Um, so, right now, I have this US grand jury, which has been investigating me for 18 months, and uh, it appears to have filed a secret indictment, which it will use to try and extradite me to the United States. At the same time, uh, I have a case in the Supreme Court here in Great Britain, which used to be the House of Lords, uh, and uh, if, 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 if I'm not successful, then I will be extradited to Sweden, imprisoned immediately, uh, without charge. I have not been charged ever um, in, in, in any country. Uh, and then be 
um, go through a, a sex trial or not, maybe they will drop it. But they refused to come over here to, to uh, interview me, to ask questions. We offered to do this by phone, to go to the Swedish embassy here. They refused to do this. Instead, they demand to extradite me to ask questions without any charge. And this is the, the situation I have been in now uh, under house arrest. I have an electronic um, manacle around my leg uh, to report my location. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's a bit grim. But uh, on the other hand, I do have a platform. You know, it, it, it does give me, to a degree, um, a platform. And this process comes out of the legislation uh, in Europe in response to 9-11. So this particular thing that I'm entrapped under came about as a result of uh, European police departments and governments saying we must have a way to quickly take terrorists from one European country uh, to another European country. Now, the, the same draconian laws are used in other cases. Yeah. You must know the rule of the game, enjoy yourself, be calm, relax. We'll, we, you will be vindicated and we'll meet you, London or Kuala Lumpur. <laughs>